nice seeing you guys. Uh, hello, hello. Uh, I guess we'll just go ahead and get started and the rest of the people will filter in as they do. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Zachary Rainey. I'm the Partnerships and Events Manager at One Valley. Today, we're very excited to be host, uh, hosting a webinar with Boast uh, here with uh, Brian and Anastasia, uh, and we'll be getting into that shortly. Uh, but for the uninitiated, we just want to let you guys know a little bit about Passport, who we are, what we do, and why we do these kinds of webinars with uh, the folks like uh, the people at uh, Boast and uh, a couple of uh, other partners. Passport is the world's most comprehensive digital uh, innovation platform. We connect entrepreneurs, emerging startups with all the vital resources that they need, the networks. And uh, we also offer a lot of potential savings on uh, a lot of different uh, products and services you're already leveraging uh, for, your own, uh, for your own business, like over a million dollars in perks, access to uh, hundreds of uh, investors, and a, a pretty robust mentor network with a lot of different uh, varying backgrounds. Um, today, in particular, Particular, uh, for the audience, uh, we reached out to Boast to uh, kind of help us facilitate this webinar on how to leverage non-dilutive funding for your uh, to to accelerate your growth and scale up. Uh, and so, um, I'm definitely not the domain expert in that field, but Boast mm -hmm. is. So we're going to go ahead and hand the mic over to them. Brian, Anastasia, thank you so much for joining me today, and very excited to hear more about uh, how we can uh, leverage some of these other streams to grow our businesses. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zach. And welcome, everybody. I am so excited to have you here. So before we dive a little bit deeper, just want to do kind of a quick agenda for today. We're going to go through basically an introduction, kind of like who I am and why um, this matters, why I care about these things. And second thing is all the different types of non dilutive funding and why you should care. And after that, we're going to take a look at a quick peek at the different kind of like types of non-dilutive funding that's available to you right now and where you can find this money. And last but not least, I'm going to pass that on to my colleague, Brian, who's going to talk about r and Tax Credits 101. That will all make sense at the end, I promise you. Um, if you're only having kind of like one takeaway from, the, from here today is that as an entrepreneur, please take a look at r and Tax Credits because that's where the biggest money that you're living on the table, okay? All right. So um, a little bit more about us before we dive deeper. Um, first and foremost, my name is Anastasia. I'm the director of partnerships here at Bose. In previous lives, I've been a startup operator. I've been an investor. Um, one thing that I, what, what kind of like attracts me to this particular topic, to be honest, is watching the pain from multiple different entrepreneurs, realizing that they're giving up too much equity. And at some point, by the time they get to their series A or series B, they don't even own the majority of the company anymore. So this is why this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. This is why I joined Bose because I do believe that as founders, we need to be a, a bit smarter in how we're using different types of capital because it's not just equity, you guys. Um, so a little bit more about Bose. We are the largest r and tax credit software companies. Um, we got founded in 2011 about a thousand companies now in, within our client and we have recouped them or have given them 350 million in tax credits. Um, and with that, we shall begin the different types of non-dilutive funding. So non-dilutive funding really is any kind of funding that doesn't require you to give up any equity in your business. As founders, you're able to maintain complete ownership over, over your company, which means you can operate with more autonomy. But there is no question that equity funding, and this is the funding you get from your angel investors and your VC, also play a crucial role in your business growth. But please bear in mind, again, as I alluded earlier, it is not the only source of capital. It is extremely expensive and, expensive, and if you're not careful, you may lose too much equity in the process. Non-dilutive funding is especially attractive for new companies and new founders who want to retain better control of their ventures. It is also useful for you guys that depend heavily on digital marketing spend or need instant, instantaneous flow of working capital to achieve sustainable growth. So why should you consider um, non-dilutive funding? We'll dive into this a little bit deeper, but the cliff note is it will manage your dilution and it protects yourself in case of a down round. So why, you sh why should you consider non-dilutive? 
first and foremost, retain control because you're not giving up equity. You have more control over your company, the, which also protects you in the case of a down round. Example of that would be, say kind of like, I'm sure you've all read TechCrunch and all the other um, uh, newsletter kind of like raising, this company raised 10 million, 10 million seed round or next company, $70 million series A. You have to ask your, the question, like at what valuation? If they're raising that much and a lot of that money is actually going into customer acquisition or and not kind of like to actually build the product, then you're asking kind of like if they're raising so much and the valuation is so high, can they actually meet that valuation at the next um, fundraising round? If not, then you're risking a down round, which is not a good thing for your company. Um, the second reason why entrepreneurs really need to consider non dilutive funding um, is to manage the cash flow. If you again, if you depend heavily on marketing spend for your acquisition, you need to take a look at non dilutive because this is a good way to protect your equity. Um, the third reason why is to establish your credibility earlier on. What does this mean? The reality is when you're talking to an investor, when you're talking to a banker, when you're talking like trying to get a line of credit, they will take a look at your entire financial stack. The fact that you have more than one source of capital is actually a good sign. It tells them that you're sophisticated in managing your finances, your company's finances, and you are going to be smart in how you grow. And last but not least, it's free-ish. When I say ish, because it actually takes time to find these things. <laughs> so with all of that in mind, and now that we are on, we're in agreement on why we need to take a look at non dilutive funding, I do want to highlight three different general buckets of non dilutive The first one is your loans. So this is the one that's coming from your commercial bank or kind of like any um, uh, tech-focused tech like banking facility. Uh, you might have kind of your typical line of credit, you might have your revenue-based financing, but you also have your venture debt. Venture debt, by the way, is minimally dilutive because it can be converted into equity and it's usually following an equity round. So say that you're raising 1 million in seed round, you can actually tack on another 500 or maybe 750 in venture debt. So your total raise would be about 1.5 to 1.75. The second bucket of non dilutive funding is grants. Grants are preemptive. What does that mean? It essentially means upfront money. You get awarded money in advance before you start a project. And then this money is a bit more predictable and guaranteed. But this also means that you need to be proactive in finding all these grants and what you qualify for and how you're going to use it. Um, we're going to go through some examples of these grants that you can take advantage right away. And I can send the link to you um, after as well. Last but not least, the third bucket is tax credit. It's retroactive. What does that mean? It is a spend it to get it. You must first spend the money and then claim back a portion that is eligible when you file your corporate tax return. Um, the thing kind of like with retroactive is that it requires documentation and proof of work. It requires kind of like some engineering or scientific intelligence to file. And it's also contingent on um, your the way you package the whole thing or whether or not you get it. And that's why even though it's it gives you the most money uh, and most predictable, it's also a little bit more complicated. So um, when we talk about grants in the US, so we're talking about Small Business Innovation Research, or SBIR. So SBIR are federal grants um, that are designed to stimulate technological innovation from the government perspective. It, me it needs to meet federal research and development needs, and it basically trying to foster participation in innovation. All this all means is that government needs something. They don't know what the solution might be. So they give out grants for companies that might be addressing this particular problem to actually provide them with the solution. So that would be the easiest way to look at SBIR. So what is SBIR and then what does that mean for you as a company, how much money you can get? This is a quick overview of the different grants startups can get from SBIRs. The most important thing to remember with any funding, but especially with government grants is that you cannot let these grants distract you from your commercial goals. 
if you're fundamentally focused on commercial uh, or non-federal sales, pursuing Sphere is a solution uh, kind of and building your solution just kind of like for your government needs, you need to understand that that might not be commercially viable. So don't get distracted chasing this free money from government if it's not aligned with where you want to be in the future. So definitely take a, keep that in mind as you're thinking about your own capital needs and your product growth and then where you want to go. Because ultimately, you don't want to build your entire company just to service the U.S. government. Right. I'm going to get into a little bit of examples of the different spheres that are available federally, but I'm not going to go through them in details. Um, if you want to leave your email addresses um, on, on the chat, or if you want to, I'm going to drop a link here. If you want to put your email and info in that link in that form, what I will do is I will email you a list of these companies and also how you can actually access all of these grants. So just kind of like follow the link that's in the chat, insert your contact info when you kind of like talk to someone or like find one of those forms and I'll send you all of this information, okay? So the first one is the NAV Small Business. So essentially it is uh, $10,000 for the first one and then $5,000 for the any runner up. There is no special criteria, but you need to kind of like sign up for their own account. The next one is on the job training program. So if you're hiring a lot of people and if you're trying to move um, your team member from one department to another, this is a really good one because it offers reimbursement for up to 50% of a new employee's training wage for up to six months. So that's uh, quite a lot of savings on your end. Next one is the micro grants. This is from the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, this is not a lot, this is about $3,000, but again, like fairly easy to do. And last but not least, the AMBER program, which is specifically for female entrepreneurs. It is at about $10,000 monthly or at $25,000 for like annually. So again, um, uh, my colleague Sarah will try to catch your email addresses that's your, that you're putting in chat, but really the best way, the fastest way to get this information is to go to the One Valley uh, link that I provided in there, and then we'll get you the information that you need. And Heather, thank you for a shout out, and I'm so glad that you got the Amber Grant. Um, I hope that the process wasn't too painful for you. So listening kind of like to all of these like types. And again, this is just a taste of what's available out there. You might be wondering what else am I eligible for? How else can I get money? If you remember earlier, we talked about three different types of non dilutive funding. You have your loans, which is like your venture debt, like line of credit from the banks and um, revenue-based financing, which is great uh, to have like once you're a little bit like later stage. There's the free money from government um, that is grants, which is what we just talked about now. Um, and then later there is also tax credit, which my colleague Brian will talk about. But for grants specifically, if this is just a taste, what else is available to you? Because you saw that there, there was uh, a big kind of a chart with potentially how much you can get from each uh, federal government. So this is how. You can go to a government site. That's the reality. Um, so government side uh, will actually give you kind of like a list of all of these spheres that, that is out there right now, but it is difficult to navigate. It probably took me a good chunk amount of time to just to find a sliver of those grants that are applicable to you right now. Um, so in the interest of saving times, I actually highly recommend going with grants aggregators such as Pocketed or TurboSphere to actually find these grants for you. So what grant aggregator does essentially is they would come to like most, I guess, government sites in Canada and the US and they would figure out based on your company profile and the stage of where you're at in terms of employees and revenue, what you would be eligible for. So I took kind of like a screenshot there as well, kind of like of the different like interactive or an UX of, uh, of the grant aggregator versus government site. And I will include the link to Pocket and Turbo Spear um, at a recap email at the end of the session. But again, if you're if you click on that one valley link, 
Um, I can also send that to you directly. And yes, to answer Serge's question, you can click either click request demo or talk to someone and they will give you kind of like the form. Okay, now the third bucket of what we were talking about, which is uh, the R&D tax credits. So if we have, um, I think kind of like I might have seen people that are um, in Canada. So just as an FYI in Canada, this program is called SHRED, but for the intensive purpose of this session, we're only gonna cover R&D tax credit, which is US based. But if you wanna understand a little bit more about the Canadian side of this, or even the different grants that you have access to, I'm gonna drop my email address um, here in the chat. So feel free to send me an email and we can take it from there. But in the meantime, I'm gonna pass the floor to my colleague, Brian, uh, to talk about our new tax credit. Brian, over to awesome. you. Awesome, thanks Anastasia. Uh, great kind of introduction on not, op, different options for non-dilutive funding. So as Anastasia mentioned here at Boats, how we keep the lights on is we help companies with R&D tax credits. That's essentially what we do. We help on both sides of the border up in Canada and also in the States. Uh, two things I like to share at the outset to kind of get this kicked off is that it's literally free money from the government for investing in R&D in the United States. So you can have international labor or a blend of both, but for the purposes of this conversation and the program itself, it's only relevant for your US or domestic labor. That's kind of the best way to think about it. And then same on the Canadian side, if you're thinking about the Canadian program that Anastasia touched on, Shred, it's only relevant for your Canadian labor. <clears throat> Second kind of thing I like to share, Anastasia touched on this a little bit, but it is a spend it to get it program meaning that's money that the company has already spent and dusted, and then we help recover a portion of it. So it's different from kind of the first section of this webinar where those are grants and funding up front. This is not grants and funding up front. It's money that you've already um, spent, whether that's through a loan, whether that's bootstrapped um, out of pocket, or if you are kind of raised equity elsewhere. So private, um, private money, as long as it's not a government grant of any sort, then we can help recover a portion of it. Let's see, Anastasia, can you move me to the next slide? Perfect, perfect. So essentially this program has been around since the 80s, but it was made permanent in 2015. Uh, there's different options that you can use to kind of uh, uh, leverage this credit to create a cash benefit. Still don't have, there we go. So there's a, so there's, there go, there's a small delay on kind of the controlling. We go back one slide, sorry. Perfect. So you can use the credit to either offset the company's income taxes in the real year. So just one more forward. Sorry about that. There we go. So you can use the credits to offset the company's income taxes in the fiscal year. So this is pretty powerful. It's a one-to-one -one offset, meaning that if you owe a tax bill of a hundred grand and we help you recover 70 grand, then you're only paying the tax bill of 30. So it's pretty powerful one-to-one -one offset for income taxes. Um, you have the option to use this credit to offset a previous tax year as well. You can go back one year back, or you can carry this for, uh, credit forward 20 years forward if you currently are not profitable. I know that a bulk of the clients that we speak to, they're typically not in a profitable or taxable position at the moment, whether that's intentional or they're kind of uh, investing in growth versus kind of profitability and no one wants to kind of pay their taxes, um, their, their revenue in taxes, right? So another option that you can use is you can use this credit to offset the company's payroll taxes. What payroll taxes are is it's 6.2% of each W-2 employee salary, also known as social security taxes or FICA. So it's typically paid automatically through your payroll provider. We come in at, at the end of every quarter and get you a refund check from the IRS. So it's a refund check that directly impacts your bottom line. You can allocate it to more headcount, take the team out, pretty much whatever you want. It, it directly impacts your bottom line. The caveat to that is in order to qualify and use the credit to offset the company's payroll taxes, the company must have under 5 million in revenue for the tax year and then under five years of revenue from the tax year. So an example of this is the fiscal year that just ended, 2021. In order to use credits that you recover in 2021 to offset payroll taxes, the company must have under 5 million in revenue in 2021. 
and no revenues in 2015 or prior, 2016 or prior, my apologies. So again, under 5 million revenue in the tax year and then less than five years of revenue from the tax year. So what can be claimed? So there's typically four categories that you can claim. The first one is um, employees of the company. The second one would be domestic contractors. So this is 1099s. If you guys hire a consulting firm to do any R&D work and their boots on the ground are in the US, then we can recover a portion of that as well. The third one would be any kind of hosting cost. So this is AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, wherever you host your software that falls into the off-premise lease and computer costs. And then the last one would be material costs. When you think about material costs though, this is more relevant for companies that have manufacturing, a biotechnology component, or if they have a hardware component to their business. So it's not, I bought a laptop for Brian so he can code every day, it's materials consumed and destroyed during the R&D process. So again, more relevant for manufacturing, biotechnology, or if you have a hardware component to your business. In those four categories, just as a quick reminder, W2s, 1099s, hosting costs and material costs, we can look to recover from the federal level is about 10%. That's kind of the napkin math. So if you have half a million dollars in spend annually in those four categories, you can look to get back about $50,000 in credits or uh, cash back if you qualify for the payroll offset. At the state level, each state also has a different um, kind of return amount. Most states range anywhere from two to 3%. The example is California is one of the higher ones. They come back at 7.5%. The important thing about the state level credit is that it's typically exclusively only used to offset income taxes owing in the state. So if you're not currently profitable and paying corporate taxes in those states, then uh, you'd be able to carry forward these credits on the book. So for most of our clients, the kind of meat on the bone is the federal tax credit, because if you fall into that kind of bucket of under five million revenue in under five years, then you can kind of get a refund via your payroll offset. Okay. So when to claim, so uh, this is done with your corporate taxes. So if you have a, if you're a C Corp with the December year end, that's either on April 15th, or if you go on extension October 15th. And then if you're an S Corp or a partnership like an LLC, then that would be either March 15th, or if you go on extension September 15th. If you are taking advantage of the payroll offset, uh, so getting cash back versus offsetting income taxes owing, you would have to follow this with a timely tax return. So that's to be done with the original copy. You can't go back and amend uh, your previous taxes to kind of use this credit to get uh, cash back. So that's kind of important. Perfect. So this is kind of uh, where both comes into play. So in order to file for the credit, you need what they call an R&D tax study, which is a financial and technical justification. The financial piece is pretty straightforward. You have the W-2s, you have the 1099s. The hard part is the technical qualification. R&D is a pretty loaded term. Companies use it very differently across kind of industries or just across even two companies itself. They might classify something as R&D differently. So when you think about R&D from the IRS's perspective, there's four things that the projects that the team is working on must meet in order to meet the IRS's criteria. The first one is they must be used to create or improve a business component, meaning that you're looking to commercialize this product. We're not just in the garage building something and trying to claim R&D tax credits. The second one is the mo most important thing is the elimination of uncertainty. And this has to be out of the lens of a technical or scientific lens. So meaning that when you uh, are working on these projects, there's some kind of technological uncertainty going into it. Meaning that I can't just do a quick Google search to find the solution to the kind of problem that the team is having. There's no open API online. This doesn't mean that it has to be new and novel per se. Your competitor across the street can have the exact same technology as long as you don't have public access to it. So this example I like to use a lot is think about Uber and Lyft. They both have very similar business models, but they both have massive R&D tax claims because their technology isn't publicly available. So it's kind of exclusive to your domain. The third one is there's a process of uh, experimentation. Typically what this means for the IRS is if you're not in that kind of biotechnology lens, then you're probably not putting together a hypothesis and then uh, doing testing formally. But as long as there's a project management tool in place, then that typically suffices. Just making sure that there's a JIRA or GitHub, something like that, for example, meaning that the work being done isn't just made up, it's being tracked and progress is kind of um, being tracked so that if your claim does go to an audit or review, 
the IRS has something to kind of look at and be like, okay, this is definitely R&D eligible. And then the last one is pretty straightforward. It has to be technological in nature. So it has to either be in the field of um, a hard science like chemistry, biological science, or like an example, computer science. So it can't be in the field of social science or humanity. So a question we get a lot is, hey, can you send out, I sent out a bunch of surveys for market research. That's R&D, quote unquote, but that for the IRS doesn't qualify because there's no technological nature to that. It's just kind of feedback from the community. Next slide. Perfect. So where kind of both comes into play is we've built software to kind of automate a lot of this process. Um, historically, in this arena, the it's been a very manual process, ton of spreadsheets. A lot of the work is left on kind of the client themselves versus kind of the provider, whether that's the accountant or just a boutique shop. Uh, typically, the feedback that we get is most clients spend anywhere from 60 to 80 hours throughout the whole year putting this claim together. But with both, most clients spend no more than two to three hours to kind of get this cash back. We understand that the return amounts are relatively low, so 10%. So we understand that founders like yourselves want to recover this cash, but they don't want to spend a lot of time getting it because sometimes it's just not as meaningful as, say, the Canadian program or something else that you might be um, wanting to work on. So kind of our process, what we do is we integrate with the uh, client's data. I'll kind of go over some of the payroll integrations or financial integrations or technical integrations that we do integrate with. The next step after integrating with them is we have that, their kind of payroll data from there. We do a, a quick onboarding call to go over what we've uncovered and how much we expect to get back. The next step is we everyone that handles these claims on staff has a background in engineering or product. So they're all experts in the field and then um, our experts like to speak with one of your lead engineers or CTO just for 45 to 60 minutes to understand the technical work that the team worked on. And from those kind of three steps, um, we gather all that detail. We do all of the heavy lifting and we ask for 10 to 15 minutes to review the documentation prior to submitting the claim. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward process for uh, most of our founders from that perspective. Perfect. So these are some of the things that we do. This is kind of just a screenshot of our dashboard. So our goal is to kind of collect data from a time tracking or from a payroll perspective and financial perspective, also hooking up with your project um, tracking systems like a JIRA or GitHub. And from there, throughout the fiscal year, we can give estimates in terms of how much you are looking to get back, just a predict, um, predictable amount. So we can hook up to the client's payroll, accounting systems, again, product tracking, and then we provide the tax forms and audit evidence through our platform as well. Next slide. There's just a list of some of our integrations. If you see your payroll kind of provider here or your accounting system, it's probably some of the most common ones that um, most companies use. If it's not on here, we can also do a CSV upload as well. Next slide. Perfect. So again, what we've found is that since uh, everyone that handles these claims on staff has a background in engineering or product, typically we're able to maximize the claim while reducing the risk and being IRS compliant as well, along with the software that kind of automates a good portion of this process. Let's see, next slide. So everything that we do here at BOSE is uh, backed by our audit both audit shield. So essentially, if your claim does, in a rare instance, that does go to an IRS audit or review, we help defend that claim at no extra cost. So we take that liability off of our client and also off of the accountant as well. Again, I kind of touched on this. It's backed by R&D um, tax credit experts. So we have everyone that handles these claims from a technical perspective has a background in engineering or product. So we never ask our clients to self-identify work. Um, we typically find that if someone's self-identifying work, they're leaving money on the table. And then also, because they tend to just be more conservative, they don't understand what the IRS looks for. Um, and then we also have CPAs on staff as well to kind of uh, review the financial perspective. This is a quick uh, differentiation, uh, just the legacy consultants and then the big fours like accountants and then how we come into play. Happy to kind of dive into this more on a one-on-one -on -one conversation. If you reach out, uh, visit our website and request to speak to an expert or reach out to myself or Anastasia. Next slide. Yep, that wraps it up on my end. Thanks for the time today. 
really appreciate it. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you, Brian. I guess kind of like, I know that was a lot of information and we'll dive into the Q&A um, in a little bit here. But first and foremost, just want to do a quick recap. Essentially, as an entrepreneur, you have so many different levers when it comes to different types of capital. So don't feel like you're kind of like uh, just have to kind of focus on equity alone. Equity is great. It's not the end on be all. So again, quick recap, on the non-dilutive side, you have two different buckets. You have your, your typical loans, which is great for your, when you're a little bit later stage. You have your grants, which are like some of the examples that we talk about. This requires you to apply and then be a bit more proactive in the beginning. Um, and then I also share kind of a couple of grant aggregators and which we will also email to everyone at the end. Um, and last but not least is the R&D tax credit. What you need to understand is from the government perspective, they call it R&D, but really any part of your product development costs, because the majority of you are technology companies, or if you're kind of like building something new, something innovative, chances are you can claim a portion of that back from the government. And that's what Brian was talking about. So um, Brian, kind of like correct me if I'm wrong, but I think some startups can get anywhere between 50 to 250K, right? Like for, for R&D tax credits. Exactly. So our average client here at Boast gets over six figures, so upwards of 110K. So just kind of depending, the biggest challenge for many founders is the program itself is expended to get it, right? So the more you spend, the more you can recover. But if you're spending money on R&D, we're pretty confident that we're able to help recover a portion of it. And something that I'll kind of touch on um, without getting too much in the weeds is we work on a success basis here at Boast. So we never ask our clients to create budget for a project like this. We don't get paid until you get the actual cash benefit from the IRS. So we have our incentives aligned with many of our clients and startups themselves. Awesome. So kind of like, again, kind of like the RD tax credit is definitely like, it's quite a big chunk of money. It's anywhere between a 50 to $250,000 if you qualify. Um, so it's a free consult for one Valley member. So feel free to just like email us. Uh, I think I put my email address uh, at the top earlier so we can actually help you figure out whether or not you qualify but really if you do any product development you would probably qualify so now getting to the q a earlier um i saw a question from there uh, the question is corporate sponsorship isn't on the list of non dilutive funding don't you think it's a possibility and becoming more of an option these days between startups and established corporate brands or sponsors even fortune 500s there i think the question is what do you mean by corporate sponsorship so corporate sponsorship to put together an event or a campaign, we wouldn't consider that as non-dilutive funding in terms of like good revenue because that's part of your go-to-market strategy because you're looking at it as this is like a way for me to associate the brand and all that. So it could be kind of like a client depending on um, kind of like how, how you describe it. I see that there is raising her his or her hand. Um, do you want to speak um, to the group? Sarah, can we, okay, uh, there, I just turn on your mic, so feel free. There, if you want to unmute, you can ask your questions live. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. Oh, great. Okay, so basically, I asked this question because I'm exploring this uh, corporate sponsorship. And, and from the perspective of corporate sponsorship, being for events, you know, the it's it's a lot bigger these days. Now uh, brands, you know, give startups real funding, even in the tunes of one million, five million dollars, you know, and all of that, and real cash. And uh, basically, it has to do with, you know, you being a startup, understanding what kind of funding you need, and then, you know, you, you if your if your solution, you know, works in line with a, a brand, for example, Coca Cola you know, being a soft drinks company, if you have an invention or an idea or a business that is in line with what Coca-Cola is doing, you can approach Coca-Cola and probably, you know, build something bespoke, like a bespoke solution, you know, that will serve them and also serve you on the commercial value. And so even all these uh, Fortune 500 companies now are setting up accelerator programs. They are setting up uh, venture mm -hmm. opportunities. Coca-Cola so, has the founder, yeah. the first fund, you know, and I, I understand you're coming from a little bit better now. Um, so when it comes to kind of like corporate sponsorship in that regard, 
it is a little bit more difficult to classify that as a non dilutive funding because if you're part of a corporate accelerator, chances are you still need to give up a, a certain point of equity or the IP itself. If they're giving you money to build a solution or a custom solution, that's not necessarily just like general non dilutive funding that's available to everyone is very specific right like there is no like job board or anything from the government you could consider that as a part of your non dilutive funding and um, funding strategy or, or capital for growth i think that's great but the one thing that i will say for everyone here for every founder here to keep in mind whether that corporate sponsorship or even the spheres that we talked about earlier don't let it distract you from your original product vision because it's so easy to think of, oh, I've got a whale of a client. I've got Coke here ready to give me a million dollars to get a custom solution. But before you know it, the entire million dollar would end up kind of like going into building that custom solution. It's not necessarily helping you kind of like building the commercial product or get like a profit out of it. So that's the only thing that I would suggest for people to keep in mind if they're getting into the corporate sponsorship side of things. Um, that's the the next question that we have is from Greg. Some of the spear deadlines have come and gone. Is there a rolling deadline for some grants? I believe that there is because at the end of the day, government funding being government funding, once um, like once they kind of like allocated the amount that they haven't used up the amount, they need to kind of like do that by a certain time. So I am not an expert in all things government grants. That's why we have grant aggregators like pocketed and through Sphere, definitely take a look at them because they will only filter out the ones that are still accepting applications, okay? So the reason why we're doing this is just kind of like as an overview for you, for founders to think about the different type of capital that is available to you. So Sergey, um, last question there, is there any money for acquiring land or warehouse to do product development and R&D? Again, um, definitely go to the grant aggregator side, like that would give you a better idea of what's available in your state um, and federally, because from state to state is different. It's a little bit difficult to pinpoint, yes, this is the, the money or this is not the money. Again, it also depends on the project that you're working on, right? Like if it's agriculture, there could be something from the Department of Agriculture. If it's like clean tech, there might be something from the Department um, of Environment. So definitely take a look at that. Uh, Greg, the whole topic is very hard to digest. Is there a concierge to help navigate through this labyrinth? I completely get it. Um, when it comes to kind of like non dilutive funding, is there are the three different buckets. That's why the the best way we can um, we can help you see this is by looking at non dilutive into three different buckets. The first one is loans. So this is like the typical money that you need to pay back. It's non dilutive in that way. The grants is free money from government that you need to um, apply for. And then the third bucket is tax credit, like Arnie tax credits that Brian talked about, that essentially figuring out the cost that you have already incurred within your company and proactively reclaiming that back from the IRS. Uh, is there a concierge? Yes, that's why both exist. Like we help on the R&D side of things, but for the grants, that's why we keep kind of like going back to the grant aggregator because they're the concierge for the grants and different money that's available. Um, what about crowdfunding like Kickstarter, Patreon, GoFundMe, Indiegogo, et cetera, for non dilutive funding? Yes, they're certainly part of your non dilutive funding as well. Um, so you can definitely launch a campaign and all that. But again, um, this is kind of like a separate fundraising strategy. And sometimes kind of like you have to think about how much time do you want to put into that as well. But there, does, that is a very good example of other types of non dilutive funding. I hope that this is sparking kind of like the, um, your mind to think about all the different potential avenues for you to get capital outside of equity. And if anyone have any other questions into uh, like the different types of, of these programs, uh, feel free to drop them in the, in the Q&A or use kind of like the, I think kind of Sarah has shared my email address there as well. So you can definitely ask me questions um, about any of it. Even though I don't know the answer, I promise I'll get you uh, the right person to connect with to find the answer. But I, uh, yeah, if you have any feedback on kind of like how, 
how you feel this session has gone and what you would like us to kind of dive a bit deeper, let us know as well. Um, and last but not least, um, if you are building innovative products, if you're running a startup with technology um, in mind, definitely look at RD tax credit because there is a lot of money that people leave, are leaving on the table. Um, that's it for my session today. And with that, Zach, I will pass it on back to you. Great. Uh, it's a very informational session. Thank you, Brian and Anastasia for all of that. Uh, and I think uh, our community also got a lot out of that. Uh, as as mentioned uh, by Anastasia and Brian in chat, please visit them, message them. They're very open to having conversations with you guys uh, to learn about your problems, see if there's a way uh, to work around them and maybe get you guys uh, plugged into some of these uh, these streams. Uh, for cash flow. Um, other than that, I just wanted to let you guys know uh, that we have an event coming up tomorrow uh, at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, the link to uh, register for this event is in the chat. One moment, let me grab it for you. I had it for a second and then I didn't. There we go. And uh, so uh, it's going to be a fantastic uh, webinar on big, da uh, big data startups. We're going to have a, a great fireside chat with Jason Williamson, global head of Oracle for Startups, talking about how he um, works with entrepreneurs. Uh, and uh, also working, uh, we have a panel and seven startups pitching for uh, a pretty big uh, cash prize. Speaking of uh, uh, other ways of buffeting your business and making sure that you can uh, get the uh, most bang for your buck, every person that RSVPs for this event will also be receiving $1,000 in Oracle Cloud credits. Uh, so definitely heavily encouraged for those that are leveraging any kind of tech stack for their for their applications and things like that. Other than that, the link is in the, uh, the chat. Uh, chat box for you guys if you want to register for it. But uh, thank you, Anastasia, Brian, for all of your time today. And uh, we uh, look forward to the next time that we're able to welcome you back on screen. Uh, so yeah, thanks, everybody. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Zach. Appreciate it. Bye, mm -hmm. everyone.